morning. Welcome to this public meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission. We're meeting to today to consider draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to establish safety standard for table saws. The issue of table saw safety is one the commission has worked on for over 20 years, and the hazards from table saw blades is severe. Lacerations, fractures, and amputations are far too commonplace. According to NICE estimates, Table saw accidents result in an average of over 4,000 finger amputations a year. It's a huge number. And to put that in perspective, if you laid those fingers end to end, you'd have a line that would reach up to the top of the Empire State Building. No, sorry, the top of the Eiffel Tower. Every year that would happen. That does happen. The proposed safety standard uh, we consider today will go a long way to prevent those injuries. And the proposed rules expect, expected to address over 49,000 trips to the emergency room annually. Staff's confident in these results because of the work that's been done builds on the agency's work over many, many years and changing commissions. This proposal is based on this proposed rulemaking the commission issued in 2017. Given the length of time since the NPR is issued, additional testing done by CPSC and changes in the marketplace, staff updated that package so we can get additional stake, uh, input from stakeholders. But neither injuries caused by table saws nor the safety standard we're going to consider today are new. In my view, uh, action is long overdue. And should this pro proposed rule go forward, I look forward to robust comments from stakeholders. We're going to start with questions for staff. We have several staff members present to answer questions, if there are any. With us are Caroline Paul, Director, Division of Mechanical and Combustion Engineering in the Office of Hazard Reduction and Identification, and Michael Rogers, Attorney, Office of General Counsel. Also in attendance are Jason Levine, Executive Director, Austin Schlick, General Counsel, and Alberto Mills, Commission Secretary. Each commission will have five minutes for questions, multiple rounds necessary, um, and the questions, after the questions are complete, staff will be excused and moved to consideration of the package. As a reminder, while commissioners may voice our personal views on legal issues, it's not appropriate to discuss any legal advice provided to us by the Office of the General, Pub, uh, General Counsel in a public session. Legal advice must remain confidential. So at this point in time, I'm going to turn to see if there are questions for the staff. I don't have any. Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I do have some questions. Um, uh, Ms. Rogers, Ms. Paul, thank you for being here for, for all your work on the package. Uh, last week, uh, OIRA issued new guidance to help agencies uh, design regulations that promote competition in the marketplace. Uh, the purpose of this guidance is to ensure that uh, regulatory actions like this and SNPR appropriately consider competition to identify policy options that are pro-competition and, and therefore pro-consumer. Um, can you please discuss how this NPR is consistent with that guidance? Oh, oh, sorry. I'm I'm not familiar with the guidance. It was from OMB. Have you not had an opportunity to review it? The OMB guidance. Yeah, so I'll I'll take that question. So the uh, CPSC staff uh, did review that uh, that guidance from OMB. Uh, we didn't really have any uh, comments on it. It had been circulated. It was primarily with the director of economic staff since it deals with the uh, economic analyses. Okay. Would you like to answer the question? Um, sure. Um, so I, I would say that um, what we try to do in this case, you know, because there is a potential, you know, like there, there, are, there are several questions about potential creation of a monopoly. Uh, it's not our perception that, that that's the case because, you know, there are like more than three companies now with different technologies that, uh, you know, are available in the market. Um, there is one company that, you know, recently introduced a new technology and it was not subject to any patent, uh, you know, issues. So essentially I would say, you know, that, that I, we don't believe that a monopoly will be created out of this. And I, I understand that the, the, the IP landscape uh, uh, on, on the issue that we're talking about today. I, I guess I was asking more about the uh, OMB guidance and, and a walkthrough about sort of what we've done here to make sure that uh, that 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 our rulemaking analysis is is consistent with with what OMB has has guided us to do. Well, 
Well, you know, since the package was put together before the, the guidance, uh, we we haven't had the time to you know to make it consistent yet. But I think so we, we haven't can... made it consistent with the OMB guidance. It, I'll, it, I'll ask this: the guidance specifically it, notes that uh, that there are benefits from consulting with competition experts like the Federal Trade Commission and DOJ's Antitrust Division. Has has anyone from our staff consulted with DOJ or FTC in putting together the proposal we're considering today? Yes, we did. Okay. We consulted with FTC uh, uh, because they have uh, methodologies to you know to deal with this. Uh, we uh, basically we 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 got information from them so that we can get a qualitative uh, description and improvement of you know our, our you know assessment, but not a quantitative one. Can we get a readout of those conversations? Uh, I, I believe so. Okay. I, I don't okay. Think I, I would like to see that. Thank you. Uh, and you were speaking to this, Mr. Tejeda, the, 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 the rulemaking that we have in front of us today, it's controversial because it will likely force participants to license standard essential patents from one, maybe two firms that, that own this IP. And by concentrating market power in the way that we're proposing, we would essentially bless the ability of this one firm uh, to raise costs on its rivals, lessen competition, and, and ultimately uh, harm consumers. So, Mr. Chairman, I, I'd like to enter in a copy of the uh, OIRA's 2023 guidance on competition effects for the record, which my staff has uh, already shared with the secretary. Um, second question, S staff assumes that this proposed standard would be 90% effective in reducing injuries. Uh, the briefing package states that the data provided by SawStop demonstrates over 7,000 activations by the SawStop AIM technology uh, that resulted in no severe injuries. Uh, my question is, how have we verified the data that was provided by the petitioner? But it was supplied as a uh, response to comment. It's in the public record, so we take it at face value. Okay, so we have an independently verified their claims of 7,000 activations with no injuries? Uh, not for that particular uh, submission. Okay. The, uh, when they say no severe injuries, how do you interpret that? What, is, what does no severe injuries mean? I believe whether or not the, for us, it would be whether the victim had to go seek medical attention. When we based our effectiveness, it was also based on our own testing of technology, as well as our search of uh, other sources such as UL on what was considered. Okay. So a minor versus severe injury. Go another round. Yes. Yes, please. Uh, Commissioner Trump, did you have questions? Sure. Uh, just some follow ups there. So, Mr. Boniface, it sounded like you had more to offer on the question of whether this complies with OMB guidance. Uh, and I wanted to give you a chance to finish that answer. Sure. Thank you very much. Uh, so, two elements. One is uh, as an independent regulatory agency, we're not required to follow the OERA guidance. However, as uh, Mr. Tejeda noted, we, uh, we as a practice do. It's uh, good regulatory practice, and we did consult uh, rather heavily with with the FTC on on the uh, development of the competition. It's a uh, 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 the issue is is central to this rule, and so we've put a lot of analysis in it, and we've asked for a lot of comments in this proposed rule uh, uh, going forward. And uh, Miss Paul, it sounded like you had some more to offer on. Um... The, the data analysis, the, the review of data that, that we've gotten in and, and how we've looked at that and reviewed that. Uh, just that in my view that the submission from SoftWaps is a supplementary, kind of a nice add-on, but the bulk of our analysis and conclusions were based on our own testing and our work with UL and um, our own health sciences review, extensive review of injury severity caused by lacerations from the tearing motion of a table saw blade. So, so we reviewed this ourselves in house. That was a cherry on top. We didn't need that information from saw stop, but it was it's nice to add. Is that fair? Yes. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's all I have. Wish well. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you, Ms. Paul. Um, can I just ask you, does the NPR dictate how manufacturers must meet the performance requirements as the proposal? No, the proposed rule is a performance standard that does not specify our particular technology. 
So staff does not assume this results in monopoly or any kind of dictation of how the performance should be. Uh, that is why performance requirements are preferred. The requirement simply uh, limits the depth of cut to a surrogate finger to three and a half millimeters or less. Uh, we are aware of two firms, SawStop and Bosch, that have introduced table saws that could meet this performance and recently became aware of another. And uh, that occurred since the 2017 NPR. But again, the emphasis is that we are not telling um, anyone how to meet these requirements. However, it is met. It would be great. It would limit the depth of cut to something between a, a bandage and requiring microsurgery. Thank you for that. And what about test methods? Are we prescribing a specific test method in this proposal? Along that vein, we do not because there are many different ways to get at this. And I think the recent uh, technologies that have come to market uh, show that how if you try to do that, you would limit things. We've seen now technology based on reverse polarity of magnets. We've seen technology based on explosions of um, capsules that are similar to an airbag, as well as the original uh, technology that uh, started this petition in terms of um, actually what now seems more cumbersome uh, transfer of energy from a, a, a solid break into a blade and using angular momentum to bring that entire blade below the surface. We've also seen uh, technology in terms of capacitive sensing. Um, it could be optical, it could be thermal, and that's why a performance requirement would truly allow innovation. Thank you for that. Um, and in terms of injuries, can you describe um, the trend, say, since 2010, whether you've seen an increase, a decrease in injuries, particularly since the introduction of the modular blade guard requirements in the voluntary arena? That is, uh, I have been involved with this project since 2003, really since I started CPSC 26 years ago. And we have not seen in any trend analyses, whether we're looking at uh, straight numbers of injuries, whether we're looking at diagnoses in terms of lacerations and amputations, it's not even that they're shifting to something else, uh, just stubbornly remains constant around 32,000 a year. And this is significant because since 2010, all table saw so the United States have converted to meet the voluntary standards that incorporate a modular blade guard design. So each year, the market is saturated with more and more of these products as the expected life expectancy of table saws are replaced, and yet that number has not changed. And with the special study, I sat in with the multiple, uh, you know, five or six people looking through IDIs of every single one of these injuries that we were able to do follow up interviews with in 2017, and they're horrendous. Guard hasn't been adjusted. Thank you. Sorry about that. Do you have a view uh, as to why the modular blade guard hasn't been effective? I can only give my personal view and is that um, I would say the one thing that we saw in the special study deep dive was that people are not using the blade guard. Whether it's modular or traditional. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. I don't have any additional questions at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Actually, yeah, both your questions were my questions. So uh, I know there's a request for another round. I uh, turn it back to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I did want to circle back to uh, some of the questions I had on on the injury data. Um, what do we know about incidents where the AIM technology should have activated but didn't? Um, this would speak directly to the reliability of the AIM technology, which I, I think is important for us as a commission to assess. Are, are, do we know of incidents where the AIM technology has failed? And if so, are there resulting injuries that, that that we know of? In terms of the NICE data, that information is not available. And in terms of the follow-up in the special study, we did not come across any where that had occurred. When I hear about the uh, SawStop active injury, injury mitigation is system, it's usually more that it uh, activated when the person did not intend it to. Okay. Um, and, and because that's an issue, uh, are, are we aware of instances where consumers have deactivated or bypassed the AAM technology? Um, and, and if so, how are those incidents accounted for in staff's assessment? I'm not aware of any of those incidents. 
Okay. You you mentioned, I think, in the response to uh, a question from my colleague, Commissioner Boyle, that you're aware of two firms that have introduced saws with the AAM technology, um, that one is SawStop and the other is Bosch. Does Bosch have any currently AIM-enabled saws on the marketplace for purchase today? They do not. Okay. Um, the cost injury model that you guys presented, staff developed a monetary estimate that's based in, in large part on jury awards. Uh, jury awards are, are designed, as we know, to, to make an injured person whole in negligence cases, including intangible costs like pain and suffering. Um, and while that calculation may be relevant in tort lawsuits, that's not really what we're deciding here in this rulemaking. Our, our job is to determine whether the products present an unreasonable risk of injury and whether or not there is, is negligence is, is interesting, but not part and parcel to uh, uh, the determination that we're making. Pain and suffering, as I understand it, it's sorry, a, a fairly highly subjective calculation in lawsuits. Uh, I'm concerned that our cost benefit analysis relies too heavily on an intangible metric like this, and, and thus might skew the benefits of the proposal. Can you please speak to the why this type of, of, of analysis is appropriate here and, and where we may have relied on that in previous rulemakings? Sure. Um, so the, the ICM, you know, when, when it's um, used uh, for specific uh, injuries, it selects a specific set of uh, injuries related to the product that's been studied. And, and also it selects a similar uh, type of cases to estimate the intangible benefit. So, you, sh you know, normally uh, the estimate is uh, specific to the product itself because, you know, it uses injuries related to the product as well as, you know, injury, uh, uh, um, injury awards that are also uh, somehow connected to, to, the, to the product it itself. Okay. I I'm not sure that I follow, so I may have some, some, some additional questions. Uh, did, did, did staff consider other objective measures to, to calculate intangible benefits? No. Okay. Um, I, I, I want to ask about the, and Commissioner Boyle uh, 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 did, did touch on this, uh, but with respect to the 2017 uh, special study on table saws, uh, that study found a, a lower risk of injury on table saws equipped with the modular blade system and, and those that met the, the latest voluntary standards um, as compared to the table saws that, 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 that don't. Um, but staff discounts the risk. I, in doing so, I think the commission may be may creating uh, some additional legal risk if the rule proceeds as staff proposed, um, not giving the 2017 special study as, as much weight as it, 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 it might receive. Um, I think that's a risk, particularly in light of the uh, our re recent, recent loss in the D.C. Circuit. Um, it, it's my hope that commenters will address this and the other concerns I've raised today. I, I, I do, again, want to thank all of you for answering my questions this morning. Uh, Mr. Chairman, at this time, I, I do have no further questions. Thank you. Commissioner Tromka? Just, just one last question then. On that, that um, study that looked at modular blade guards and other modest safety features, it found that there was almost no benefit compared to the baseline. Isn't that right? Uh, th those didn't make it significantly safer, which is why we're here today. If it's based on the nice trend analyses, yes, we do not find that they have made a difference. Thank you. Well, Commissioner Wall? I don't have anything further. Thank you. Hearing no further questions for the staff, we can excuse them, thank them for the work on this. Before pointing the matter as proposed by the staff to a vote, I'm going to entertain any motions from the commissioners uh, to amend the proposal. Commissioner Feldman, do you have any amendments? Commissioner Trumka? I have none. And Commissioner Boyle? No, I don't have any. And I have none as well. So, uh, hearing no uh, amendments, I move to approve the draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking to establish a safe, uh, safety standard for table saws. Is there a second? Second. We have a second and can move forward to the vote. Uh, Commissioner Feldman, how do you vote? I vote no. Commissioner Trumka? Yes. Commissioner Boyle? Yes. And I vote yes as well. The yeses are three, the noes are one. The draft supplemental notice of proposed rulemaking on table saws passes. And at this point in time, we have uh, up to 10 minutes per commissioner to, for any closing remarks. So I'm going to start myself. 
And first, I want to thank the, the CPSC staff for their work on this issue. Um, it's already been a very long effort, um, even though it's not done yet. And I appreciate their commitment to improving the safety of table saws. As we saw today, we had a number of questions that were raised, uh, and I think that is appropriate and exact reason why you put something out for a um, uh, for comment. Um, so as things were, were raised up, um, that is why I felt very comfortable moving forward at this point in time. So those issues can be uh, commented on by stakeholders and then the, the commission can assess that. Because I had mentioned earlier, the severity and the ubiquity of the injuries associated with table saw blades compels action. I look forward to, you know, the number of amputations, lacerations and fractures are happening each year are tremendous. And the trend lines, as we have heard from staff today, have not changed in, uh, in the period that we've been working on this. So I look forward to a robust comment from all stakeholders, including consumer groups, industry representative, advocates on the proposed standards. Feedback will help us move forward on a final rule so we can reduce and perhaps eliminate the amputations and other serious injuries caused every day by table saws. Uh, move to Commissioner Feldman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I, I do want to thank staff for being here to answer questions and for all the, their work on this rulemaking over the years. Um, having now watched and read as much as I could in the time that I had, I know that that you've worked hard on on what is a complex matter and something that that frankly includes many unknown variables. Uh, unfortunately, a majority of the commission didn't support a briefing on uh, the subject, despite half of us wanting one. Uh, these briefings are something that prior commissions have received, but we bypassed, and I, I do think that that's unfortunate. The products that we're dealing with today are complicated. A, a briefing would have allowed us more time to study the issue and ask more meaningful questions to, to staff about the proposal, its implications, and the data on which we're relying. I would note that neither I nor any of my current colleagues sat on this dais uh, during the earlier briefings, and I typically vote to publish rulemaking notices. The public comments that we receive are an opportunity to solicit a wide range of opinions, like the chairman said, uh, regarding the soundness of our proposals. And this process helps the commission improve draft product and, and address key issues. Uh, this general principle, though, depends on the soundness of the initial staff proposal. And unfortunately, here, I think the SNPR still has too many unanswered foundational questions and unknown issues to send it out for public comment. For that reason, today I break from a general practice of supporting these notices. And while I, I have a couple of concerns related to the rulemaking, I, I want to limit my remarks to three areas. First, I, I still have many unanswered questions about the intellectual property necessary to comply with the proposed rule. This is one of the key issues uh, in, in, in what we're trying to do here. Staff states clearly in the briefing package that the proposed rule would most likely require all suppliers to use patented technology uh, in their table saw. Staff take some comfort in noting that two of the relevant patents that, they, that they've identified are set to expire soon. But the package also notes that as of 2016, SawStop had more than 100 table saw patents and that Dr. Gass had filed 140 patent, patent applications that may still be relevant. We don't know what patents Dr. Gass, TTS, or SawStop have secured in the interim since 2016, but we do know that SawStop is actively pursuing a litigation strategy to extend the length of the relevant patents where it can, including at least one recent appeal to the U.S. Supreme Court. I don't share staff's comfort, therefore. The SNPR states that we don't know the extent to which these patents would impede other manufacturers from producing table saws with AAM technology. We don't even know what patents would be essential to the safety standard. We have no idea what additional IP exists, including filings within the last seven years. We have no idea what, uh, what whether the current IP holders will license their holdings on fair and reasonable terms. We don't know who owns what patent. I don't agree with the Biden administration on everything. However, the OIRA guidance that was issued last week is helpful. It's recommendation that regulatory agencies carefully consider the competition landscape of the decisions that they're making is a sound one. This morning, I asked whether we had consulted with the DOJ and the FTC. Uh, we had, and, and, and that's, that's helpful. But, but it's a mistake for the CPSC to depart so radically from the pro-consumer, pro-competition safeguards that OIRA endorsed. And this information, is, frankly, is critical to our decision making. Approving the proposal without such basic information is premature and misguided. I'm concerned that the commission runs a very real risk of creating monopoly in the table saw market. 
To that end, I've drafted letters uh, to certain parties who I believe may own or control relevant IP, including Dr. A uh, Dr. Gass, TTS, and the Felder Group, to seek answers to some of these questions. There may be patent holders that we don't know of, and that is reason enough for the Commission and our staff uh, to continue doing our homework before taking any next steps. Second issue I want to raise, raise and it's related uh, to the IP licensing terms, they would have a substantial effect on, on table saw costs. Between the IP licensing, redesign, and other related costs, staff forecasts that the per unit increases could exceed $1,000 per saw, saw, maybe 20% or 30% higher than even that. I suspect that's why the chief counsel for the advocacy at the U.S. Small Business Administration offered comments suggesting that, that uh, suggesting changes to the 2017 NPR, which we didn't adopt in the current SNPR. If we finalize this rule, the cost of table saws will increase. This will directly affect consumers, including small contracting businesses that, we, that, that, that rely heavily on these products. I'm also concerned that the benefit side of the cost benefit calculation here is deficient. The commission both discounts the 2017 special study and uses a pain and suffering metric that arising from jury tort awards to account for almost 70% of the estimated benefits. I'm concerned about the reliability of the SNPR's cost and benefit calculations. Uh, and, and again, I, I, I think that's reason enough to pause what we're doing here today. But third, as I mentioned before, I believe this rulemaking needed a public briefing and more time for commissioners to ask questions and receive staff feedback. The rulemaking's controversial history and the fact that the briefing package runs to 166 pages demonstrates the complexity of the issues. None of the current commissioners were present when the, uh, the ANPR or the NPR were considered in 2017. While CPS CPSC staff has been working on this issue for more than 20 years, the pending NPR is new to this commission. In my view, uh, voting it out today without a complete record and answers to foundational questions, the commission's missing an important opportunity to engage in reasoned and thoughtful policymaking. Nevertheless, I, I encourage all stakeholders to submit comments on the issues that I've raised as others, as well as others, others that I might have missed. I hope that the IP holders uh, will respond on the record to the questions I'm sending them. I look forward to reading the comments when they come in, and I hope that they can fill in the gaps of whatever steps the commission might take next. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for organizing the hearing today. I have the balance of my time. Commissioner Chomka. Here's some of the gloves that I wear in my workshop. And you could probably guess that I get a decent number of scrapes and cuts. Sometimes that means I have to super glue them shut or, or at worst get a few stitches. But I still have all my fingers. And that's probably because the one tool in my workshop that I stopped using is my table saw. I had too many close calls with it. I had pieces that got jerked in towards the saw blade and moved my hand far too close to a spinning saw blade. I had pieces shoot across the room with enough force to put holes in drywall. I couldn't justify continuing to use it. It just wasn't safe enough. So I created workarounds. Sometimes I use my miter saw or my router table uh, or homemade jigs that let me use my circular saw for long cuts. And now that I work at CPSC, I see that my concerns are backed up by the numbers. Table saws send almost 50,000 people a year to the ER. And there are gruesome injuries. These are gruesome injuries like fractures and finger amputations. The Civil War was responsible for 60,000 amputations. Table saws are responsible for 65,000 amputations just since we were petitioned to fix the issue. But today we advance a rule to save those fingers to stop those amputations. Technology exists that could prevent saws from cutting more than three and a half millimeters into skin. That turns a trip to the ER into a trip to the medicine cabinet for a Band-Aid. And our rule would require that level of safety. In doing so, the, the rule would provide perhaps the greatest benefit to society of any rule in this agency's history, at least any that I'm aware of, with up to $2.32 billion in net benefits every year going forward. It's troubling that it took this long. An inventor created this solution a quarter century ago, back in 1999, and he petitioned this agency to require that level of safety on all table saws back in 2003. We've missed an opportunity over 20 years, and in that time, table saws have injured 1 million people. That inventor, by the way, went from idea to working prototype by himself in less than a month. So it probably wouldn't be very difficult for major saw manufacturers to quickly come up with workable solutions to this issue. 
but they might not even need to because they might already have those solutions. Other saw makers have created and implemented equivalent solutions. There may be licensing deals and options that would allow most major brands to access technology like that today. Why then aren't they doing it? Why isn't this safety technology ubiquitous? The, ans the answer might be as simple as money. It seems that saw sellers appear to be scared that if they start selling saws that are safer, they might open themselves up to liabil uh, product liability lawsuits when injuries occur in greater numbers on their other saws. So we're in danger to protect their bank accounts. And I don't appreciate that. And just a reminder, this proposal comes with this historic $2.32 billion annual net benefit, even with the assumption that companies are gonna struggle with getting patent license or need to invent new technology from scratch. But if any of the companies have rights to existing technology that works now, the net benefits will be even higher. So when you talk about that struggle is a red herring. The rule already assumes that difficulty and bakes it in, and that difficulty may not even exist. The one place where I draw issue with this proposal, just one, is that it wants to wait three more years before this rule goes into effect. That would mean condemning 150,000 more people, innocent people, to serious and gruesome injury, people we should instead be protecting. In the final rule, which I hope to receive later this fiscal year, we'll have to select an effective date that's reasonably necessary to address the hazard. With a rule that has billions of dollars in annual net benefits, a logical question to ask might be, isn't there a reasonable need to start gaining those benefits now? To start gaining those benefits as soon as possible, maybe even 30 days after the rule goes into effect, because that's the shortest period we're allowed to do that by law. And on the other end of the spectrum, the longest period we're allowed to do by law is six months. To depart beyond that requires good cause. Here, staff seeks to depart all the way up to three years, and I don't currently see any good cause to do so. And while we don't need to show, that it will be easy for companies to comply quickly, we may learn that it is, which would make shortening the effective date all the more necessary. We know that three companies have already sold the saw with AIM technology. It's also my understanding that many table saw manufacturers might currently have the rights to compliant safety features and might be choosing not to incorporate them. It's my understanding that the industry lobbying group, the Power Tool Institute, undertook a joint venture among members, including Hitachi, Bosch, Stanley Black & Decker, and Tektronix, and appear to have created viable saw safety features, which may be usable by all members. Today, I sent letters to the leadership at Bosch, TTS, SawStop, Hitachi, Stanley Black & Decker, and Tektronix, seeking information on which of them have access to AIM technology that would allow them to comply with the proposed performance requirements. Their answers are due on November 15th, and I've asked them to submit those answers to the Commission Secretary for inclusion on the public record. While we don't need that information, to go forward with this rule as written, it would be relevant to shortening the effective date considerably. And I expect honest answers to those questions. And commenters, I encourage you to please weigh in with any other reasons why a shorter effective date is reasonably necessary. I wish this agency had done 20 years ago what we're doing today. We'd have prevented a million trips to the ER. 65,000 people would still have all their fingers, including at least one friend of mine. Today, we did good. In the coming months, let's decide to do good faster. Thank you. Commissioner Moyle. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And I want to thank uh, Ms. Paul for all of your work. I think you're the second CPSC staff member in the last couple of weeks who has um, indicated they've spent decades working on a, a project. And um, uh, I think it should go without saying that that's too long. So I appreciate that we are here finally to be able to move this uh, proposal forward. I do look forward to comments. I think if there are ways to make our proposal better, I certainly welcome them, but we are long overdue and I thank you for all your work. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to um, all commissioners for engagement today and for the staff for all their work over a long period of time. And with that, that concludes today's decisional meeting of the Consumer Product Safety Commission.